UK's Labour set for landslide election win. Hezbollah launches largest retaliatory attacks on Israel. Good afternoon and Salam Malaysia Madani. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching World Today with me, Daryl Baptist. We begin today's bulletin with updates on Britain's election. Britain's main opposition Labour Party looks set for a landslide election win with Keir Starmer replacing Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister, ending 14 years of Conservative rule. As polling stations closed at 10 p.m., the poll suggested centre-left Labour would win 410 seats in the 650-seat parliament, with the right-wing Tories managing only 131. In another boost for the centrists, the smaller opposition Liberal Democrats would get 61 seats, but Nigel Farage's anti-immigration reform UK upstarts could secure 13. Labour's majority would be 170, more than double than that won by Boris Johnson for the Tories at the last election in December 2019, dominated by Brexit. Tim Bale, politics professor at Queen Mary University of London, called the projected result a disaster for the Conservative Party. Counting off ballots from some 40,000 polling stations across the country stretches into the night, with official results expected into Friday morning. Sunderland, Newcastle and Blythe Valley have historically been the fastest centres to declare their winners. Meanwhile, Labour leader Keir Starmer is re-elected MP for his constituency of Holborn and St Pancras. Speaking at the announcement of the results, Starmer declares that the UK is ready for change as exit polls predict a landslide for his party, putting him on course to become Britain's new Prime Minister. Because tonight people here and around the country have spoken and they're ready for change, to end the politics of performance a return to politics as public service. The change begins right here because this is your democracy, your community and your future. You have voted. It is now time for us to deliver. Thank you very much. We now move to the Middle East where Lebanon's Hezbollah launched more than 200 rock rockets and drones at Israeli army positions, escalating tensions between the two adversaries as the Israel-Hamas war rages on in Gaza. Hezbollah said it fired more than 200 rockets and explosive drones at army positions in northern Israel and the Israeli annexed Golan Heights in retaliation for an Israeli strike that killed one of the Iran-backed group's commanders. Israel killed senior Hezbollah commander Mohammed Naame Nasser with a strike in the Lebanese coastal city of Tyre on Wednesday. Air raid sirens blared across northern Israel in the morning and AFP correspondent witnessed rockets crossing the frontier that were mostly intercepted by Israeli air defences but sparked wildfires. A military source said later a soldier was killed by a rocket fired into northern Israel. Israel and Hezbollah, an ally of Hamas, have exchanged nearly daily cross-border fire since the Gaza war erupted on 7th October, stoking fears of an escalation into all-out war. In Jerusalem, thousands of anti-government protesters took to the streets to call for the release of hostages, as talks on a deal between Hamas and Israel are reportedly set to resume. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told US President Joe Biden he has decided to send a delegation to resume stalled negotiations on a hostage release deal with Hamas. A source in the Israeli negotiating team said there was a real chance of achieving an agreement after Hamas made a revised proposal on the terms of a deal. An Israeli official said the head of Israel's Mossad intelligence agency would lead the Israeli delegation for the talks. 
In other developments, Saudi Arabia's main humanitarian agency said the Israeli closure of Rafah and other crossings into Gaza was hampering its aid efforts to send life-saving food, some of which is in danger of spoiling. Abdullah al-Rabiya, the head of the state-run King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center, said hundreds of trucks are waiting in Rafah because of the closure. He said food on hundreds of trucks waiting to enter Gaza and stored in warehouses could be approaching expiry with the closure of the crossing since 7th May, when Israel stepped up its offensive. Food and medicine for Palestinians in Gaza are piling up in Egypt, while sporadic supplies are now sent through Jordan and the West Bank to Gaza's Kirim Shalom crossing. The Saudi government's humanitarian arm, launched an air and sea bridge from Riyadh to Al Arish and Rafah, has flown more than 54 civilian and military planes and sent eight ships through Jeddah port, relief operations in partnership with the UN. Over in Russia, President Vladimir Putin said he would not declare a ceasefire in Ukraine until Kyiv takes steps that are irreversible and acceptable to Moscow. Putin said it was pointless for Russia to attempt to appeal to the Ukrainian parliament when it came to Moscow's ideas to end the conflict between the two countries. Просто сейчас взять объявить о прекращении огня в надежде на то, что обратная сторона предпримет какие-то позитивные шаги, мы просто не можем. Это первое. However, he took seriously U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump's comments that he could bring about a quick end to the fighting in Ukraine. Putin has always claimed to be open to talks on ending the conflict, though last month demanded Ukraine effectively capitulate as a precondition of a ceasefire. The Kremlin leader had called for Ukraine to pull its troops out of the south and east of the country, vacating territory currently held by its forces if it wanted Russia's offensive to end. The leaders of China and Russia urge their allies and partners to resist malign external influence, advancing their shared anti-Western agenda at a regional summit in Central Asia. China's President Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin pressed their case for closer security, political and economic cooperation between countries of the vast Eurasian region as a counterweight to Western alliances. They were speaking on the second and final day of the summit in the Kazakh capital Astana of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or SCO, a club launched in 2001 by Russia, China and Central Asian states, and now including India, Iran and Pakistan. Xi called on the countries to resist external interference, while Putin claimed new centers of political and economic might were on the rise. In a joint declaration published by the Kremlin, the group noted tectonic shifts in global politics and called for the bloc to play an enhanced role in global and regional security. The SEO was founded in 2001 but has come to prominence in recent years. Alongside China, Russia and Belarus, its full members are India, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan and Tajikistan. It is intended to be a platform for cooperation in competition with the West, with a focus on security and economics and Central Asia in particular, and claims to represent 40% of the global population and about 30% of its GDP. On the other end of the world, in the U.S., President Joe Biden said he is not going anywhere as he faced calls by many Democrats to end his re-election bid using the 4th of July celebrations on Thursday to hit back at doubts about his stamina and mental austerity to continue his campaign. The 81-year-old Democrat's shaky showing at a debate with Republican rival Donald Trump means his every appearance is now closely scrutinized. Reading from a teleprompter, Biden made no major errors in delivering brief remarks, but at one point appeared to go off script to make reference to a war cemetery that Trump declined to visit while in office. And by the way, you know, I was in that World War I cemetery. 
at, in France. And uh, the one that my — one of our colleagues, the former president, didn't want to go and be up there. I probably shouldn't even say it. Anyway. <laughs> we got to just remember who in the hell we are. We're the United States of America. Yeah. United, and there's nothing. Nothing beyond — and I mean this in the bottom of my heart. There is nothing beyond our capacity, nothing, when we do it together. Not a single thing. Responding to a supporter who told him to keep up the fight, Biden said he is not going anywhere. However, more calls continued to come in for Biden to step aside, heaping pressure on his upcoming engagements, which include a primetime interview with ABC News on Friday and a press conference during the NATO summit next week in Washington. British magazine The Economist became the latest major publication urging Biden to withdraw, joining the New York Times and Boston Globe editorial boards. Coming up next, six arrested after more than 100 people killed in religious rush. Indian police arrested six people in connection with the mass crushing of devotees at a Hindu religious event in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh this week, in which at least 121 people were killed. The incident occurred on Tuesday in the village of Pulrai Mughal Gahi in the Hatras district, where about 250,000 people had gathered to listen to preacher Suraj Pal Singh, also known as Bahol Baba. Police said the four men and two women arrested were aides to Baba, who were involved in organizing the event but fled when the stampede broke out. Baba blamed the stampede on anti-social elements but did not elaborate. Officials said it started when some devotees ran towards the preacher's vehicle but were stopped by his aides, leading to commotion during which some of them fell to the ground and were trampled. Others who tried to run to open fields to escape slipped on the uneven ground and fell in the path of the rest of the crowd. Uttar Pradesh Police Inspector General Shalab Matur said it was too early to say whether Baba played a role in the stampede. AP Singh, Baba's lawyer, said he would represent the six people who were arrested. Peru's Congress passed a law introducing a statute of limitations for crimes against humanity, despite opposition from human rights organizations who argue the measure will hamper ongoing investigations into serious abuses. The law passed with 15 votes in favor and 12 against in the Congress's permanent commission after the right-wing dominated legislature initially approved the law last month. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights this week urged Peru to annul or block the law, but the government of President Dina Boluarte swiftly rejected this and blasted it as interference. The law needs to be signed by the president before implementation. Boluarte is expected to do so in the coming days. Rights groups say the law would cut short dozens of investigations into human rights abuses committed before 2003, when fighting between security forces and rebel groups left 69,000 people dead or missing at the end of last century. The European Union will impose tariffs on up to of rather of up to 37.6% starting today on imports of electric vehicles made in China ratcheting up trade tensions between Beijing. There is however a 4 month window during which the tariffs are only provisional and intensive talks are expected to continue between the two sides. The European Commission's provisional duties are designed to prevent what its president Ursula von der Leyen has said is a threatened flood of cheap EVs built under state subsidies. The EU anti-subsidy investigation has nearly four more months to run. At the end of it, the Commission, the EU's executive arm, 
could propose definite duties, typically applying for five years, on which EU members would vote. China's Commerce Ministry said on Thursday both sides have so far held several rounds of technical talks over tariffs on the issue. BYD will face duties of 17.4%, Geely 19.9% and SAIC 37.6%. These are on top of the EU's standard 10% duty on car imports. Companies deemed by the EU to have cooperated with the anti-subsidy investigation, including Western car makers Tesla and BMW, will be subject to 20.8% tariffs, and those that did not cooperate, a rate of 37.6%. In an official ceremony preceded by Chilean President Gabriel Boric in central Chile, the icebreaker Almirante Viel was handed over to the Chilean Navy. The icebreaker AGB 46 Almirante Viel was commissioned by former President Michel Bachelet in 2017 and is the first icebreaker built in South America. The ship will replace the former icebreaker AP-46 and its home port will be located in Punta Arenas. During the ceremony, Boric called the vessel a floating ambassador and a messenger of Chile's commitment to the White Continent. According to the Chilean government, the ship can transport 120 people consisting 86 crew members and 34 scientists. It can also reach a speed of 15 knots and 3 knots over ice. The ship can also carry two HH-32 helicopters, operate at negative 30 degrees Celsius and navigate up to 650 kilometers further south than the previous icebreaker. According to the Chilean government, the vessel will help safeguard Antarctic sovereign rights and continue to position Chile as a relevant actor in matters of maritime security, national and international research and cooperation in search and rescue operations in the polar continent. Italy's civil protection escalated the alert level for Stromboli volcano to red on Thursday and indicated an operational pre-alert phase following a significant increase in volcanic activity. Video released by the Italian fire brigades showed a pyroclastic flow rapidly descending from the volcano, reaching the coastline and extending into the sea for several hundred meters. Tremboli is the most explosive volcano due to the composition of the magma, and it can erupt more explosively due to minute variations in the chemical compositions of its magma. Simultaneously, volcanic activity has intensified in Sicily's Mount Etna as well, prompting local authorities to temporarily close the airport in Catania. Volcanic activity from Etna's Voragine crater has intensified this week with vigorous explosions and incandescent shreds following a four-year silence. The 3,330-meter-high volcano Mount Etna, Europe's tallest active volcano, is believed to have the longest documented history of eruptions among all volcanoes, with records dating back to as early as 425 BC. Drone video captured the trail of destruction in the Caribbean island of Cariacou after Hurricane Beryl hit Grenada. Grenada's Prime Minister Dickon Mitchell described Armageddon-like conditions after the storm made impact earlier in the week, while also confirming three deaths. Beryl has so far left at least 10 people dead, but that number has widely expected to rise as communications are restored on islands devastated by flooding and powerful winds. Beryl moved away from Jamaica early on Thursday. Beryl's destructive power, coming so early in the hurricane season, underscores the consequences of a warmer Atlantic Ocean, which scientists cite as a sign of human-caused climate change fueling extreme weather. In Mexico, residents of the popular beachside destination of Tulum prepared for the arrival of Hurricane Barrel. Local residents seasoned in safeguarding against storms lined up at gas stations to fill their tanks and additional containers, 
while hotels and tourist complexes removed loose furniture and equipment. Mexico's National Guard was deployed to ensure safety at gas stations and to assist locals in clearing the streets of hazardous debris. Beryl is expected to hit Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula early Friday. Its winds are expected to slow further over the next day or two, but will likely remain at hurricane strength until it approaches the North American country. Still to come in sports, Murray saluted at Wimbledon despite doubles exit. It may not be quite the end for British great Andy Murray at Wimbledon, but it felt like it as the 37-year-old received an emotional farewell after he and brother Jamie were beaten in the first round of the men's doubles on Thursday. Murray, regarded as one of his country's all-time great sportsmen, returned to the scene of his two Wimbledon titles barely two weeks after surgery to remove a spinal cyst. His injury, one of the many that have plagued the Scot in the later years of his remarkable career, ruled Murray out of making one last singles appearance before he retires. That's it. Yeah, look, it, it is hard because I, I, wanna, I, I, want, I would love to keep playing, but I can't. Um, you know, physically it's just it, it's too, too tough. And, I, you know, all of the injuries of you know they've added up and like i said they, they haven't been insignificant but yeah i, I, I want to play forever i love i love the sport um it's given me you know it's given me uh, it's given me so so much um taught me lo loads of lessons um over the years that i can use um and the rest of my life but yeah i i, I don't want to stop so it is hard but wild horses would not keep him off the Wimbledon turf one more time and it felt fitting that the brothers from the Scottish town of Dunblane partnered up on the hollowed lawns for the first time in a Grand Slam. Australian duo Rinki Hijikata and John Pierce provided the opposition although for once the result felt secondary even if Murray's ferocious competitive spirit still burned brightly as the light faded on centre court. Hijikata and Piers won 7-6, 6-4, and although Murray is still scheduled to play mixed doubles with compatriot and fellow Grand Slam winner Emma Raducanu, it proved an opportune moment to celebrate the career of the former world number one. Earlier, seven-time champion Novak Djokovic came through a testing battle against British wildcard Jacob Fianley, 6-3, 6-4, 5-7, 7-5. It appeared to be business as usual for the Serbian as he coasted into a two-set lead on centre court, but the 277th ranked Fianley broke his illustrious opponent twice in the third set to reduce the deficit. Fianley, playing in his first Grand Slam, carved out two breakpoints in the sixth game of the fourth set but missed his chance and Djokovic broke into the 11th game before serving out for a win. Djokovic, who is playing with protection after a recent knee operation, is seeking to equal Federer's record of eight Wimbledon men's titles and is aiming for a record 25th Grand Slam title. Elsewhere, on day four of Wimbledon, Iga Swiatek underlined her status as the world's top player with an efficient 6-4, 6-3 victory over Croatian Petra Matic, her 21st match win in a row. The 23-year-old pole triumphed at the Madrid and Rome Opens as well as taking the Roland Garros title before switching to the Wimbledon grass and reaching the third round. Swiatek, who has won five Grand Slams but has never progressed beyond the quarterfinals here, looks comfortable on the center court grass, though she was tested at times by Martic's hefty serve and ground strokes. 
In football, the Portugal squad held a training session a day before their Euro 2024 quarterfinal clash against France. To advance in the tournament, Roberto Martinez's squad must first get past World Cup finalists France, who have flattered to deceive so far in Germany, with their measly return of three goals coming from a penalty and two own goals. Martinez has started Cristiano Ronaldo in all four of Portugal's matches. Ronaldo has been Portugal's main man for nearly two decades. But the veteran forward is a long way from peak performance before Friday's Euro 2024 quarterfinal showdown with France. Now, the 39-year-old Portugal captain is playing his club football in Saudi Arabia. Ronaldo is showing his age in what might be his last major international tournament. Portugal and France meet in the quarterfinals in Hamburg early tomorrow in a replay of the 2016 final, which Portugal won 1-0 on French soil. Along with striker Ronaldo and Bernardo Silva, midfielder João Falinha also trained with the team as rumours of his signing for Bayern Munich from Fulham intensify in German media. Kylian Mbappe, meanwhile, said it would be an honour to play against his boyhood hero, Ronaldo, when France and Portugal meet in the quarterfinals early tomorrow. Growing up, Mbappe famously decorated his bedroom wall with pictures of Ronaldo and was introduced to the Portuguese superstar at Real Madrid's training ground when the Spanish club tried to sign him as a young teenager. No, it's an honor. Everyone knows the admiration that I've always had for Cristiano, for the player. With the time, I've had the chance to know him, to talk to him many times. We're always in contact. He tries to give me some advice, to follow my actuality. It's a pleasure. To play against him, it's an honor for everything he's done in football. No matter what's happened before, what's going to happen after. Il restera une légende du jeu, mais, mais bien sûr qu'on on espère, on espère gagner demain et, et aller en demi-finale. This match will also witness Mbappe, who will yet again be wearing a protective mask after sustaining a broken nose in France's group opener against Austria. France coach Didier Deschamps said after the last 16 win over Belgium that Mbappe might need to wear the mask for months. The winner will play either Spain or host nation Germany in the semi-finals. Still within the world of football, Manchester United confirmed on Thursday that Eric Ten Hag has signed a new contract to extend his stay at Old Trafford until June 2026, as the Dutchman gets another chance to restore the record 20 times champions to former glories. Ten Hag's contract had been set to expire at the end of the 2024-2025 season, but denying City a domestic double and qualifying for the Europa League earned him another chance. Besides a shock victory over champions Manchester City in the FA Cup final, however, earned the 54-year-old Ten Hag a lifeline. Despite winning two trophies, results and performances have fallen away dramatically despite more than £400 million being spent on new players since Ten Hag took charge. United struggled early in his first season, but Ten Hag instilled a sense of togetherness that had been missing since Alex Ferguson retired in 2013. The club spoke to potential replacements, including Thomas Tuchel, but decided to stick with Ten Hag, who is looking into refreshing his backroom staff, with the former United striker Ruud van Nistelrooy and the Dutch coach René Hacke under consideration. The second season of the Premier League was much worse, but United's fan base largely stayed loyal to Ten Hag and sung his name loudly at Wembley in the Cup final as their team produced the best performance of his spell in charge. That's it for World Today this time round. In our top story, UK's Labour set for landslide election win. Do join us again this evening at 8.30pm on TV1 and Salaran Barita RTM for more. Or you can stream us online or on RTM Click's website or mobile app. My name is Daryl Baptist from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Thank you for watching. Have a memorable weekend ahead. Now it's back to you wherever you may be. Goodbye.